Thank you, uh, Max. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, at the Collaboratory. Wonderful to see all of you out on a rainy evening in Berlin. Leider, meine Deutschkenntnisse reichen nicht ganz aus, diese Gespräche auf Deutsch zu machen. Aber wenn Sie Fragen auf Deutsch äh, stellen äh, äh, wollen, dann können wir gerne ein bisschen mischen mit den Sprachen. Aber so, I, I, I'll have to do it in English, but hopefully next year when uh, maybe I get invited back to the collaboratory, my German will have improved and I'll be able to uh, give the talk in German, at least I hope. Uh, let me begin just with a minute of introduction to explain to you my background and m my work in this area. I, I started as an academic and worked in communications policy and did my doctoral work and then I went to Washington and I worked on Capitol Hill and got interested in politics. And then after that, for six years, I ran an NGO called Free Press, which some of you may be familiar with. It's the largest uh, NGO in the U.S. that works on media and telecommunications policy. And from there, I became an advisor to the Obama campaign on technology policy and got invited afterwards to become uh, an advisor to Hillary Clinton at the State Department, which was my great pleasure and privilege and was one of the most interesting experiences of my life. Um, I have the, the, the pleasure and privilege of being married to a German, which was what brings me to Berlin. And so now I am amongst you and I, I couldn't be happier to be here um, at the Collaboratory making my, my first public talk on internet policy since I have left the United States government. And as Max said, I have been giving similar speeches that were cleared by all of my US government minders for so long that I decided I had to give something new and more interesting uh, this evening. So you'll have to bear with me if it sounds a little bit rough. It's the first time that I've given this particular talk and I wanted to make it uh, interesting for you. A big part of my job at the State Department was to bring innovation to foreign policy and statecraft. Hillary Clinton believed very strongly that the internet was changing everything about international relations. And she said to us, if you accept the idea that the internet is changing international relations, it ought to be changing the practice of foreign policy. It ought to be changing the way diplomats do their work every day. So your job is to go around to all of our embassies and teach them about the internet. I thought, well, that's a good, interesting task. And then I started to do this work and realized that the State Department is one of the most conventional and conservative bureaucracies <laughs> in all of Washington. And so I feel like I have a, a very good handle on what it means to try to bring innovative ideas into the policy environment to deal with the rapidly changing environment of technology. When I first came to Berlin as a diplomat, I went to our embassy down the street. And anytime you come from Washington, you sit down with your staff at the embassy and they give you a country briefing. And they said to me, you know, what you have to understand is that the perception of the internet in Germany is quite different. I said, it's not about Steve Jobs. It's not about Bill Gates. The perception of the internet in Germany, and particularly amongst German policymakers, is not about the creative engine of innovation that we think about in Silicon Valley, or that we think about with Jimmy Wales and Wikipedia and Usenet and all of the organic innovations that we've seen online over the last generation. The internet in Germany is a dark and scary place. And they gave me a folder full of articles from the German press describing how you should be very careful when you go online because you will have your data stolen or there are criminals waiting for you or all manner of fraud happening on the internet and that government's primary role was to protect citizens from the dark and scary place that was the internet. And while, of course, not everyone in Germany thinks that way, and not all German policymakers think that way, I think that there's something to the idea that in Germany the internet is seen as a dark and scary place. And, and this is a question of culture. And while this is a collaboratory about the legal and policy barriers to innovative digital ecosystems, 
In my experience, if you want to change policy in business and in government in order to adapt to innovative digital ecosystems and produce more information, more innovation, the first thing you have to do is you have to address the culture of decision makers. And I know from dealing with the decision makers at the State Department in striped suits and red ties and white shirts that their culture is quite conservative. They're not ready to take the leap into seeing the internet as something other than a dark and scary place. And I think something similar is happening here. So instead of talking about specific law and policy related to research and development, related to the relationship between businesses and the university community, related to the way that you can start and businesses and take businesses into bankruptcy. All of these are important for innovative digital ecosystems and we can take them up in the Q&A. I want to focus my talk on the question of culture because no amount of smart ideas from experts can overcome an emotional response from decision makers who view the internet in a profoundly different way than you do. So I want to begin with this provocative hypothesis that the culture of the internet, its perception in Germany, is the primary barrier for innovative policy towards new digital ecosystems. And I want to offer three ideas to serve as the basis for this discussion. And, and these ideas are the ways that you change the culture in order to achieve changes in policies to su support innovative digital ecosystems. So idea number one, innovation is the creative response to disruptive change. To me, the word innovation by itself means nothing. It's become a buzzword. It's used so often that it's become almost meaningless. To me, innovation describes some kind of creative production. Creativity in a, in a field of work that produces a new outcome. But by itself, it's just a modifier. We can think about innovation as innovative government, or innovative business, or innovative research, or innovative diplomacy. And we can evaluate whether it's creative, and we can evaluate whether it's producing a new way of working by, by taking a look at what outcomes it's producing and understanding what kind of disruptive change is this innovative work responding to. So the first thing we have to do when we're addressing the culture of policymakers who view the internet as a dark and scary place is understand what kind of change are they responding to. What are the disruptions that they see in the world that cause them to view the internet as a dark and scary place? And I have talked to a lot of these decision makers and I, I can see very clearly their view that they're, they're uncomfortable with the fact that they've lost control over the information environment in their societies. We are gone, gone are the days of broadcasting when the mass media was controlled by a small handful of entities. We are now dealing with an information system that is entirely distributed. We have a mass media net system, a personal communications network, and the information networks of our economy all converged on a single infrastructure. The first time in history that that's happened. And it is profoundly disruptive to policymakers' ideas about how to control information systems. And it fundamentally changes the operation of power in societies. In previous information systems, large institutions, big companies, and governments controlled information networks. Now that power has been distributed. It has been decentralized to networks of individuals. And we can begin to see these changes have profound impacts all around the world. And it's profoundly uncomfortable to many policymakers. I can tell you we had an experience in the US about this loss of control. And it was a light bulb moment at the State Department. It was a light bulb moment at the White House. And it really caused us to do a lot of soul searching about the nature of information systems. It was caused by this guy. When WikiLeaks happened, I was on the job for over a year. And I had spent a lot of time crossing the world, talking to ambassadors and senior diplomats about the power of networks. 
and I'd made the case that I've just made to you, that information systems are converging onto a single network, and power is being distributed, and networks of individuals are going to form new political movements, and are going to change economies, and they would nod and say, that's interesting. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Secretary says great things about you. See you next time. <laughs> then WikiLeaks came along. And a lot of those same ambassadors called me back, and they said, all right, Ben, you were right. Now make it stop. <laughs> and I would say, Ambassador, it's not going to stop. And while in this particular instance, the power of networks has not worked out in the favor of the United States government, what you have to see is the larger message, which is that information networks are changing. And with them, so are political movements. So are the way people engage with government. So is the operation of power in our global society. But you, can, you don't just see it in WikiLeaks, you can see it all around the world. You can see it in China. Perhaps the country in the world that has taken the greatest effort to control the information system in their society. Some of you may remember the incident depicted in this picture. There was a terrible train crash on high-speed rail in China in summer of last year. And as often happens when there is a significant problem with the government ministry, in this case the transformation ministry, transportation ministry, there was an effort to cover it up. And Chinese authorities were on the scene in hours. They actually buried that train car in the ground on the spot of the accident so that there would be no forensic analysis of who was to blame for the crash. But the Chinese people had other ideas because there were many people on the train when it crashed who were members of social media networks in China. Social media networks in China are wildly popular. For those of you who are not familiar with Chinese social media, where Facebook and Twitter are banned, Chinese language social media in microblogging alone has over 300 million accounts. That is more than all the Twitter accounts in all the world. And a lot of those social media users were on these trains and they were sending messages out to the microblog when the, tr the train crash happened. And they said that the messages that people were sending out on social media were completely inconsistent with the messages of mainstream media about what happened in the train crash. And over the course of the two weeks that followed the train crash, 25 million messages were sent out on social media networks. And there was such a public outrage and a public backlash that the Chinese transportation ministry went back out to the site of the train crash. They dug up the train, they took it to Beijing, they did a full analysis of what happened. They found out exactly who was to blame. They fired those individuals and they changed safety policy for transportation systems in China. Quite an interesting story. Not isolated, of course, to China. We see the same thing happening, social media networks, political protests in Russia. And we saw them, of course, recently here in Europe, where Tens of thousands of people marched in the streets of German cities to protest against an obscure tre treaty that was being negotiated in Brussels. This shouldn't be possible. Five years ago, it would have been impossible for 10,000 people to be in the streets of Munich marching against a treaty about anti-counterfeiting policy negotiated at the global level. Today it's possible because the internet public has become political. The decentralized network of political actors have become powerful on the global stage. And for policymakers, that is a dark and scary place because they don't know how to deal with that. But what I wanted to make the case today is the same case I've made to our ambassadors, that all these things that, that make people nervous are exactly the same phenomenon that produce all the positive and all the negative effects of innovation on the internet. Cybercrime, identity theft, child pornography, cyber war, all of these things are the same phenomenon that give us our good friend Steve Jobs, that give us innovation from the grassroots, that give us commercial entrepreneurship. The digital ecosystem doesn't know good innovation and bad innovation, it simply knows creativity and new ways of working in response to disruptive change. And this may sound obvious to you as practitioners and as people who are involved in the technology space, but for policymakers, 
This is new, and it requires a cultural shift in order to get their minds around it. And it leads me to idea number two. To embrace innovation, you have to cope with vulnerability. A lot of policymakers respond to the changes they see around them by trying to eliminate vulnerability. What they're essentially trying to do is they're trying to reassert control over information networks through central authority by making policies to take away bad innovation and leave only good innovation. But it doesn't work that way. And part of the cultural shift that has to happen is for policymakers to recognize that with all of the benefits of the power of networks come vulnerabilities. And the goal of good public policy is not to eliminate vulnerabilities. Because if you eliminate vulnerabilities, you also eliminate positive creative change. The goal of good public policy is to cultivate and empower positive change and to mitigate and contain negative change. There were two, two things that, at the State Department that really brought this home to me in terms of the duality and the, of, of, of technology and the power of networks. One is, is Tor, the TOR project. People familiar with the TOR project? For those of you who are not, the TOR project um, essentially provides highly sophisticated cryptographic software in easy to use ways for people who live in vulnerable societies where internet freedom is under siege to use the internet without being uh, uh, detected by surveillance technologies. Now, the State Department was a big believer in TOR because we are a big believer in internet freedom. And we did a lot of work to try to help people understand how to use anonymization technologies like TOR. But you can imagine the people in the US government who were responsible for counterterrorism and law enforcement were not that happy about our work with TOR. How do you solve that problem? On the one hand, you have a positive development using the power of networks. On the other hand, you have a vulnerability. The answer isn't to eliminate your work in the space altogether. Similarly, after the Arab Spring, a lot of people wanted to stand up and say, hooray, there's a Twitter revolution. Well, it's not a Twitter revolution. And you can't just imagine that social media is magically going to be always good and produce democratic outcomes and empower people towards good social change. The same social media networks that helped people organize rallies in Cairo also helped the Iranian government track down dissidents and punish them and throw them in jail and per persecute their families. These technologies cut both ways, but the potential for negative consequences, the potential of vulnerabilities are not reasons to throw out our work in the space altogether. There are reasons why we have to understand the culture. Now, as I was working through this, I had, I had what, uh, for those of you who are Dr. Strangelove fans, uh, I've, I, I've put this in. This, this was my Kubrick moment, how I learned to love the internet. And, and for those of you who are from Google, I found this, which is a, a mashup of Dr. Strangelove with Google Earth, which I found particularly entertaining. But seriously, government has to recognize that policymakers' responsibilities are less about protection and more about empowerment. It's less about control and more about unleashing the creativity to produce positive change. Dealing with the vulnerabilities is going to be a part of the bargain, but our primary work is expanding opportunity and not simply guarding the status quo. Because there are no perfect solutions to the vulnerabilities that the power of networks bring. There's no perfect solution to protecting privacy on the internet. There's no perfect solution to guarding our networks and making them secure. There's no perfect solution to guaranteeing freedom of expression everywhere in the world on digital networks. There's no perfect solution to competition policy. I think, as a cultural matter, policymakers ought to take their cues from the technologists who design the internet. The internet is a best efforts network. Internet policy is going to be two. We just have to internalize what that means and recognize that we're not always going to be happy with the outcomes. So I want to close with idea number three which is, 
if you've begun to accept these assumptions into your culture of internet policy, the, the way to look forward is to say, all right, the internet culture we're trying to achieve is one of adaptation and combination. And I'll explain by what I mean by, by both of those things using two examples. Example number one, Libya, where I learned about adaptation. During the conflict in Libya, as many of you may be aware, Gaddafi cut off all communications to the eastern part of the country where the rebel strongholds were. The entire telecommunications and inf infrastructure of Libya was hub and spoke, and all the control points were in Tripoli. And so for months during the conflict, everything in rebel-held eastern Libya was completely dark in terms of communications. And the leaders of the, the, the rebel groups in Libya really understood the power of communications, not just for military purposes, but also because they saw the contrast between what was happening in Libya and what was happening in Egypt and Tunisia and elsewhere in the Arab world. The Libyan people in the revolution did not have the opportunity to tell their stories because they were not connected to a network where they could upload videos about what was happening. They were not connected to one another. They were not connected to Libyan expats around the world. And so when Gaddafi fell and the new Libyan government took over in Tripoli, they resolved to as quickly as possible adopt a new culture towards thinking about communications policy. The first thing they did was they found Gaddafi's surveillance room. There was a huge factory where they, Gaddafi had set up spies to eavesdrop on the communications of the Libyan people for years and years. They had something like 10 million minutes of international phone calls saved on racks of servers in this building. And the first thing they did was they inventoried all of the surveillance equipment that the Gaddafi government had, and they made sure they knew exactly what was there, and then they sealed off the room. And they announced from the steps of the building, we're not going to do this anymore. From now on, Libya is going to be a free society, and we're going to make the internet a tool of post-conflict stabilization. We're going to show the people of Libya that the new government believes in open networks, free communications, and participatory politics. And they have brought that adaptation into the Ministry of Communications, brand new, never existed before. And I, I met with the leaders and they are just a remarkable and inspiring group of people because they have completely internalized a very progressive way of thinking about the internet after coming out of an incredibly dark period in the history of their country. Adaptation, critical part of innovative policy making. Number two example, combination. And I'll, I'll start with Silicon Valley because when I was a, a, in the diplomatic service and I would sit with my counterparts in other governments, about nine times out of ten, at some point in the meeting, they would lean across the table and say, so, tell me, how do we build a Silicon Valley in our country? And every country has a plan to build a Silicon Valley, whether it's in Munich or in Moscow or in Bangkok. And so far, no one has quite succeeded. And I never had a good answer for how you build a Silicon Valley because there is no good answer for how you build a Silicon Valley. And the answer is not go there and try to present, persuade all of these brand name companies to come to your country. That helps, but it doesn't get you there. And so at one point about six months ago, I had the opportunity to ask one of Silicon Valley's most prominent investors, a guy named Reed Hoffman, who created LinkedIn amongst many other very successful companies. And I said, Reed, I get this question all the time. People ask me, how do I make a Silicon Valley? Tell me, what do you think? How do you make a Silicon Valley? You're a billionaire. You must know something. And he said, well, the way that I do business in Silicon Valley is I go to breakfast. I said, what are you talking about? And he said, well, when I want to start a new business, what I do is I call up my friends. And I say, well, this is the idea I have, and I think I need 
a good marketer, and I think I need a great software programmer, and I think I need a fantastic uh, graphic designer, and I think I need a lawyer, and I think I need uh, a business development expert, and I think I need an investor. Who do you think I should talk to? And my friends give me some names, and I invite them all to breakfast. And I throw my idea out on the table. And they give me their responses. And through that breakfast, I assemble a team of people who are going to make the new business for me. I combine the ideas of people who are in my social network, which, thanks to the technologies of social media, has now expanded pretty dramatically. But the most important thing about Silicon Valley is not that all the brand name companies are there and investing. It's that all the people who want to be in that culture of innovation all live nearby and can come to breakfast and combine their ideas. Which to me really represents this culture of innovation and entrepreneurship that everyone's looking to replicate. So I'll conclude by saying that for those of you who are policymakers in the room or for those of you whose goal is to influence policymakers, the next time you get the question, how do I create innovative technology policy? The answer is, go to breakfast. Thank you very much, and I uh, look forward to your questions. <laughs>